renouncing all turmoil and fondness for diversion, I reside alone in perfect ease. So that's Milarepa and Bhante comments. There's much more to this than meets the eye because turmoil and fondness for diversion go much deeper than we usually think. And therefore the perfect ease in which Milarepa says he is residing goes much deeper than ease in the usual sense. It's a complete relaxation, which is not just physical or psychological, but existential. It's the cessation of all striving because there's nothing to strive for. You've gained whatever there was to be gained. This ties in with the Mahamudra teaching, which is not a teaching about how to relax at the deepest level, because that would be self-contradictory, but just the teaching of relaxation at the deepest level of one's being. You don't even think in terms of trying to attain enlightenment. You've even gone beyond that. This is the state of profound relaxation that Milarepa is suggesting. So that's our starting point for today. So renouncing all turmoil and fondness for diversion, I reside alone in perfect ease. Just adding another thought around this perfect ease. Uh, I was reminding of uh, Bhante's direction for just sitting, where he instructed us to not even try not to try. So, uh, yeah, the connection as well for, between the absolute insecurity that we were mentioning yesterday and the perfect ease that we uh, hear about here. So renouncing all turmoil, uh, giving up all turmoil. So we probably all of us experience uh, turmoil, pain, confusion, at least to some extent, sometimes in our life. And uh, it's not much fun really, is it? So why hold on to it? Well, the thing is that, you know, at least there's something happening, you know, at least in the midst of that turmoil, pain and confusion, we can have a sense of me experiencing pain and turmoil and confusion. Uh, and even in that, we can find a sense of security, of uh, stability. But what we're being encouraged to think of here is just let go, give it up recognize it's actually a waste of time. And then fondness for diversion, this takes us back to the klesha of distraction that we looked at yesterday. Uh, it said the mind is always hungry, always hungry for something. And the only, actually, the, we need to recognize that the only real peace and satisfaction is going to be found in the enlightenment of the Buddhas. So again, the message is to let go, give up this relentless search uh, to find something, someone we can find stability and security in. Recognize it's never going to happen, it's never going to work. So the big question is, of course, how to set up the conditions uh, where this profound letting go and giving up can happen, where we can begin to see through the glaciers and the hold they have on us. There's the need for patience, kshanti, and persistence, energy, virya. And there's also the need for intelligence, a need to actually be able to recognize what's going on, begin to see the stories, the conceptual formulations, the structures that we uh, 
we build around their experience for what they are uh, and begin to see through them. Uh, yeah, knowing and seeing things as they, they really are rather than uh, being caught up in these stories and, and uh, conceptual formulations. So Milarepa is very much in the tantric tradition uh, where there's the idea of the transformation of all our energies of our whole being, body, speech and mind. And this is a theme that Bhante often comes back to the theme of total transformation supported by a, a full life in the Dharma, which at the same time needs to be practical, needs to be grounded in life, in our living experience. And hence the importance of mindfulness. Mindfulness in our body, mindfulness of the connection between our body and mind. And we can learn to really look at our experience in our body when the glaciers begin to surface, you know, begin to surface a bit like whales or monsters from the deep, you know, they break the surface. Uh, when we actually see the glaciers breaking the surface of our, our life and being, uh, you know, be it greed, hatred, pride, whatever, you know, what does it actually feel like in our body when the glaciers are appearing? And what's our experience in our body, you know, when at some level we're free of the glaciers, where we get glimpses of, at least of that perfect ease? You know, can we use our bodily experience to work with, uh, work with the glaciers and freeing ourselves on them? So we don't always know the cause of our unskillful mental states. You know, we don't always know why we're caught up in certain states. But what we can do is recognise what they look like and feel like. We can also begin to know what the skillful mental states look like and feel like. And just on that basis, begin to learn how to work and in the direction of the skillful. And this also brings in the paradox of the effort and relaxation. You know, just going back to this perfect ease of uh, Milarepa. So effort in the spiritual life, it's sometimes not the effort of doing, but rather the effort of not doing, of not doing what we habitually do. And sometimes it's much more difficult actually not to do what we habitually do than just to keep on doing what we habitually do. So it's an interesting effort, isn't it? The effort of not doing what, you know, the, the impulse of our being would let us do, have us do, and just make that effort to somehow let go, give up, allow something different to come through, come into play. I came across a really uh, striking text in the Nidana Samyutta of the Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, and just hearing it, it just sort of something you know, even without fully understanding what's being said, it just something in it resonates very strongly with me. So at Sarvati, so this is the Buddha speaking at Sarvati, no doubt in the Jetta Grove. Because this body is not yours, nor does it belong to others. It is old karma to be seen as generated <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry, generated and fashioned by volition as something to be felt. Therein bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple attends carefully and closely to dependent origination itself thus. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, 
that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, with ignorance as condition, volition, volitional formations come to be. And the Buddha then leads through the, uh, the whole Nidana chain that again, probably most of us are familiar with from our study of the wheel of life. But it's really striking, this, this first uh, phrase, isn't it? Bhikkhus, this body is not yours, nor does it belong to others. It's old karma to be seen as generated and fashioned by volition, as something to be felt. And feeling felt here is, is Vedana, pleasant, painful, neutral. So the Buddha seems to be pointing to bodily feeling, Vedana, as a way of getting focus on the karmic results of our volitions, you know, really looking at Pratichya Samutpada, this being that becomes with the arising of this, that arises and so on. You know, really using our bodily awareness to focus in very clearly on the workings of Pratitya Samutpada and Karma. So a, an obvious example of how we might do this would be just noticing a certain tightness, uh, contraction in our body when certain stories uh, about ourselves, uh, we're, we're telling ourselves, you know, going looking ahead to uh, conceit we're going to be looking at this morning as better, worse, or just as good as others. And the feeling and an experience of lightness, expansion in the body when we drop those stories or when we adopt a story that's more in line with the Dharma, with the way things really are. So yeah, we want to try and focus this morning on the klesha of conceit. So conceit is this tendency to look at ourselves as better, as worse, or equal to others. And it's a klesha. So it's not just a, a bad habit, a psychological quirk. Now what we're looking at here is a deep patterning in our being that uh, binds us to the wheel of life, to the endless round. So conceit is all about self-clinging, the way we consolidate our sense of who we are, of our world. So it might be painful, but it gives us a sense of stability, of knowing where we stand. So conceit, uh, this comparing, can be the basis of the strategies then that we uh, adopt to navigate our way through life. So for example, if we tell ourselves we're not really very lovable, uh, worthy of love, well, we'll probably avoid people and situations that might invite love. And then the rejection that we've told ourselves is going to be inevitable. If on the other hand, we like to tell ourselves we're super intelligent and smart, then we're not going to be wasting our time with people we think are stupid. Unless, of course, it gives us a chance to show off just how smart we are. So, yeah, these stories are then going to very much shape the way we go about life and relate to others. And if you remember as well from uh, our looking at the glaciers yesterday, conceit is an intellectual glacier in the sense that it's based around these stories, these concepts, these ideas that we uh, feed, feed the glacier with, construct it out of, build it out of. Uh, because it's built on 
and reinforced by these stories that we're telling ourselves again and again. And yet these, these stories may be outdated, they may never be true, but we can still be quite reluctant to let go of them. You know, we can even begin to see how silly they are, but, you know, we, 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 we don't want to let go of them. You know, if we did tell people about them, well, they may, might laugh at us. Uh, and uh, even worse, they might sort of hug us and tell us how wonderful we really are and to stop being so silly, you know. It's, and we don't want that, so we just keep these stories to ourselves. We keep them hidden. So the task for this morning in trying to begin to approach, deal with, see into, see through this uh, glacier of conceit is to begin to explore what are the stories uh, we tell ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> even if we uh, never let on what those stories are to anyone else, can we at least admit, actually really admit to ourselves, this is the story that I'm telling. And can we ask ourselves, do we actually really believe it? Uh, or is it just a, a sort of old habit still running on? Just uh, the momentum of our old karma? And can we let it go? Can we look at it objectively? And again, we might be really interesting to notice the resistance that even this thought of letting go of some of these old stories can bring bring up in us because even if they limit us somehow they still give us that sense of stability security who we are so yes and uh, in in doing this we should uh, we should we should never forget meta Meta is important. Uh, we shouldn't get too uh, too over serious and earnest in uh, exploring these stories. Now we can catch the flavour, perhaps, of if, if we do start to explore these stories, try and articulate them. We might catch maybe a flavour of self pity, of pride, of hurt and anger, but uh, it doesn't have to be a sort of angst-ridden, uh, tearful confession. You know, it can actually, well, it might be a little bit embarrassing, but, you know, it can actually be quite enjoyable, quite fun just to sort of laugh at ourselves, let go of some of these uh, stories, just uh, liberate ourselves from them. And yeah, meta being just so important in this, meta you know, meta, as Bhante described, is objective emotion. So actually beginning to see ourselves as we really are here and now. Uh, see through the, uh, the mist of those stories. A uh, friend of mine, Arloka, when he was uh, working with us at Padmaloka, had a phrase he'd often come out with of, uh, we're all just a mess in process which is uh, perhaps a useful and humbling way of looking at ourselves, but also, you know, the sense we're a mess in process towards enlightenment. You know, we're not just a sort of arbitrary mess going anywhere. We are actually honestly trying to see this sort of tangle and confusion and whatever, and really begin to uh, let go of these limiting stories let go of this uh, entanglement of, of the glacier of conceit. See, acknowledge ourselves as we are and um, allow that process then to really unfold more uh, openly, creatively, freely. <clears throat> 